Sandor is here today to help teach us how to make these beneficial microorganisms a part of our daily lives. So please join me in welcoming Sandor Katz to Connecting for Change. All right, well, hello. So usually when I get to speak in front of an audience, I have a head of cabbage and a cutting board and some jars or a crock, and, uh, and I feel a little bit naked uh, speaking without those things. So instead, I, I, have, uh, I have brought some, uh, some, some visual aids to, um, uh, to make this real and to whet our appetites before lunchtime. Um, so, I mean, let me, let me start by just showing you what initially got me interested in fermentation, and uh, it was sour pickles. I grew up in New York City, and uh, my, favorite, uh, my favorite food as a kid was, was sour pickles, uh, sometimes known as kosher dills. And uh, these kinds of pickles, uh, in contrast to the styles of pickles that fill our supermarket shelves, are actually uh, fermented in a brine, a salt water solution. And the, the acid that preserves these cucumbers is lactic acid, uh, as opposed to acetic acid, uh, which is vinegar, uh, which is how uh, m most of the commercially uh, the commercially available pickles uh, are, are preserved. Um, and really, until the 1940s, in most parts of the, the world, um, this is what a pickle meant, was, uh, was food uh, preserved by the action of lactic acid bacteria. Um, but most people eat fermented foods every day. I mean, really, like a vast array. I'll bet, I'll bet almost everyone here, if not already this morning, in the course of the past 24 hours, has enjoyed you know, some form of fermented food. Uh, perhaps it was bread. Perhaps it was cheese. Perhaps it was coffee. Perhaps it was salami or some other form of cured meat. Perhaps it was a glass of beer. Perhaps it was some wine. Perhaps it was yogurt. Perhaps it was sauerkraut or kimchi or condiments. Um, you know, uh, certain condiments like soy sauce and fish sauce are, uh, you know, directly products of fermentation, but, you know, all the others, uh, you know, including ketchup, mustard, mayonnaise, hot sauces are um, stabilized by vinegar, which is uh, itself a product of, uh, of fermentation. Um, and even chocolate is produced by fermentation. Um, you know, these foods are more than incidental cultural novelties. I mean, they really have been, um, they have been strategies for survival, or, you know, certain of them have been strategies of survival in, in different places. So, so sauerkraut has been a strategy for people in temperate climates with limited growing seasons to be able to preserve vegetables, and with those vegetables, vitamin C and other essential nutrients to get them through the winter. Um, you know, in, in a sense, uh, agriculture would not be possible without fermentation because we never could invest our energy into crops that are ready at a certain moment of the year um, uh, unless we have some uh, um, uh, you know, some notions, some strategies about how to preserve those crops to get us through the rest of the year. Um, cheese, similarly, is a form of preserved milk. I mean, milk is, you know, among the most perishable foods that, that we know. And really, you know, fresh milk is, is really a, a phenomenon of the 20th century. People who have milked animals have always had the ability to enjoy fresh milk, but everyone else has had to enjoy preserved forms of milk, whether that is sour milk um, or, or uh, ferments like yogurt or kefir or more solid forms like cheese. But cheese really is a strategy for preserving milk milk, just as salami and the other cured meats are strategies for, uh, for preserving, um, you know, those, those very, very perishable uh, meat products. Um, fermentation, uh, um, uh, you know, is a survival strategy in many other ways. These are um, cassava roots, and uh, cassava grown in certain soils in the world produces extraordinarily high levels of cyanide. 
And if people were to try to eat unprocessed uh, uh, cassava roots, they could literally kill them. So the strategy for making uh, um, these starchy tubers uh, safe to eat involves a simple fermentation, cutting them up in coarse chunks, soaking them in water, which initiates a fermentation, which digests um, uh, the cyanide into benign forms and makes it safe to eat. Um, and th these roots, you know, basically are the, are the daily staple food of about a billion people on this earth. Um, and these are soybeans. So uh, with, with soybeans, fermentation isn't really a, a strategy for, uh, for preservation, but rather for digestibility. I mean, when, when soybeans are, are, are dried, they preserve for a very, very long time. Um, but you never hear about people, you know, eating a big bowl of soybeans. And, uh, you know, if you ever want to try that, it will be a memorable event in your life. Um, but the, the, um, the, the, the uh, Asian cultures that pioneered soy agriculture developed all of these ways of fermenting the soybeans. So there's soy sauce, there's miso, there's tempeh, there's natto. Um, but what, what all of these have in common is that the soy protein gets pre-digested broken down into amino acids that become much more bioavailable to us. Um, similarly, the lactose in milk gets, uh, gets digested by fermentation. So, so pre-digestion is another great benefit of, uh, of fermentation and why it's been um, you know, really a strategy for survival around the world. Um, fermentation is at the core of many cultural practices. Um, you know, if we, if, we, if we look at the word culture, the word culture, uh, um, you know, basically comes from cultivation. Um, and as I mentioned earlier, I mean, you know, the practice of agriculture would not really be possible if we hadn't have, uh, you know, developed, uh, you know, ideas about how to effectively preserve the harvest to sustain us through uh, uh, the seasons of relative uh, uh, scarcity. But, but certainly our, uh, our senses of, you know, what we could cultivate has, uh, you know, has, has, has grown um, enormously through the years. So today, um, in laboratories everywhere, scientists are culturing cells. This is a picture of a, of a petri dish with, uh, you know, cells that are being uh, cultured, and and uh, and so we actually end up using this word culture that we use to, um, you know, describe our language and our music and our literature and our scientific knowledge and our belief systems and the totality of all the things that we seek to pass down from generation to generation also to describe these little communities of bacteria that we use in order to transform, in this instance, um, milk into yogurt. Um, so, you know, here, here is some yogurt. Uh, you know, yo yogurt uh, uh, is characterized by being a solid form of milk, and, and, and basically the, the protein structure is sort of, you know, re-knit by the bacteria as they digest the lactose. And, uh, proliferate and produce lactic acid. Um, here's a beautiful microscopy image. I mean, so you can see that each of these, uh, you know, fermentations, you know, actually involves a, an elaborate community of different types of microorganisms. In the natural world, we never find singular types of organisms. Organisms always exist in communities, and every uh, traditional fermented food um, is, uh, uh, re reflects a specific community of microorganisms. Um, some of these cultures have actually evolved into distinctive physical forms. Th this is kefir. Um, uh, you know, kefir grains or curds are these rubbery blobs that look, you know, something like florets of cauliflower. Um, uh, and they embody a, an, an, an enormously elaborate community of organisms. This is a m microscopy image of, uh, of, of, of kefir, and there's, uh, the, the biggest ones there are, are yeasts and, uh, and, and many different types of uh, bacteria and some other fungi. Um, so, I mean, these communities of organisms that have been passed down through us through, through generations, you know, have actually come to hold very important places in, um, in our, you know, cultural traditions all around the world, and they're frequently used in religious uh, uh, ceremonies and as ritual sacraments. So, you know, here's, a, you know, in, in the Roman Catholic Mass, it's not, you know, sort of some random food that, that magically trans, transubstantiates, um, but it is, you know, wine and bread, products of fermentation. Uh, 
uh, in the Jewish tradition um, uh, that I come out of, um, uh, you know, we, we sip wine as we say prayers to the creator of the fruit of the vine. And in indigenous cultures all around the world, people have, uh, you know, have always had, uh, you know, sort of ceremony and ritual revolving around, um, you know, the somewhat magical practice of fermentation. Um, you know, I think that a good way to, to state it would be that uh, successful coexistence with microorganisms is our biological imperative, and the fermentation arts, as they're practiced uh, uh, in, in various ways all around the world, are human cultural manifestations of this essential biological fact. Um, oh, okay, no image there. Okay, so here, this is... Um, this is um, the, Part of the reason why fermentation is, uh, is, is found all around the world is there's an inevitability to it. Microorganisms begin to transform our food because they are present on all of our food. Because, you know, all, um, all biological creations evolved from bacteria and have never lived without bacteria. So all of the food uh, that we eat, all of the plants and animals that constitute our food are covered with microorganisms. And uh, you know, if we don't do anything to, gu to guide the microbial development, the food rots. That's what all the food that we discard is all about. Um, uh, you know, however, um, you know, thanks to um, uh, the, the clever observation of our ancestors, um, you know, we have learned how to um, uh, guide the microbial development. So you know, here's a leaf covered with different types types of bacteria. This is a root covered with uh, 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 different types of bacteria. Um, these are, th this is microscopy from inside our intestines. You know, just like all other, uh, you know, living creatures, we are evolved from bacteria and, um, and bacteria are, are part of us in, in many different ways. Uh, these are the bacteria from a human tongue. Um, this year, the Human Microbiome Project released their findings looking at, you know, not, not just the human genome, but the cells that outnumber our bodily cells 10 to 1 that are the bacteria that we are host to, or perhaps that are host to us. Um, and this is a map of different regions of the body and the different you know, types of bacterial populations that have been, that, that have been um, um, mapped at, at different locations of our bodies. Um, and these bacteria, you know, they are not parasitic. Um, you know, they enable us to function. Um, I think everyone has understood for some time that bacteria digest food and assimilate nutrients. They also synthesize certain essential nutrients for us within our bodies. Uh, we could not reproduce without bacteria. Bacteria um, uh, create the conditions that en enable human beings to effectively reproduce. And, uh, you know, just in the last uh, uh, couple of years, there's been a lot of new information about how, how critical bacteria are in um, um, regulating our immune responses. Uh, and, and, and now there's new understanding that our brain chemistry, the release of serotonin, how we feel um, is related to the bacteria in our gut. Um, and this is normal and healthy. Um, nonetheless, we find ourselves, oh, okay, some of my, my images are gone here, but we find ourselves at war with bacteria. I mean, you know, all of us alive at this time have been indoctrinated into the idea that, uh, you know, bacteria are our enemies, that our life would somehow be better if we could eradicate all bacteria. Um, I think the most vivid man, uh, um, a reflection of this um, is antibacterial cleansing products. Um, and, you know, there's nothing sexier than a soap manufacturer could write on a, on a container, and that's what was supposed to be on this slide, than that it kills 99.9% .9 of bacteria, as if there was, this were a desirable thing. Um, but in fact, it's... <laughs> in fact, it's 99.9% .9 of bacteria that we can live with perfectly well that protect us from the 0.1% of bacteria that have the potential to make us sick. So, you know, this, 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 this war on bacteria thinking is, uh, it's misguided. And we really have to, uh, we have to change the way that we're thinking. And so, you know, our bodies are a battlefield in this war on bacteria. So, you know, antibiotic drugs, which, you know, as individuals, I'll bet lots of us in this room at some point had our lives saved by them. But across the human population, they are wildly overprescribed. 
And uh, you know, more so than in human beings, animals are pumped up with huge amounts of uh, antibiotics, uh, particularly in confinement agriculture. Um, and there's a residue of this in our meat and our milk, and a residue accumulating in our water. So all of us every day are ingesting low levels of antibiotics. And there's, then there's the chlorine that's in the water precisely to kill bacteria. So you know, all of us, you know, between all of these, these, these chemicals that we're exposed to every day, um, you know, the bacteria in our gut that we depend upon in order to, um, uh, you know, be healthy in this world um, are, are under constant assault. Um, fermented foods, um, particularly the um, live culture foods that have not been cooked after their fermentation, the foods that contain, uh, uh, you know, living bacterial populations um, are a means of, uh, you know, replenishing and diversifying the bacterial populations that are so critical to our ability to function in this world. Um, and they also just so happen to be, um, you know, the greatest delicacies that we know and the highest expression of culinary traditions all around the world. Um, uh, let me just end by talking about some other connotations of the word fermentation. Uh, you know, we talk about social ferment, uh, cultural ferment, political ferment, even intellectual ferment and spiritual ferment. Um, and, uh, and, and, and really what, what relates, uh, you know, the, um, the, uh, the, the literal and the metaphorical meanings of fermentation are bubbles. So, um, so when, when liquids begin to bubble, uh, that's the sign that they ferment. The word fermentation comes from Latin fervere, which means to boil. Um, and it's because the visible action of fermentation is um, the same as the visible action of boiling. Um, but the metaphorical sense comes because when people get excited, when people believe in change, um, they get bubbly too. We get bubbly too. And so, you know, when, when, when people get excited about some idea and they want to share it with everyone they know, you know, they talk about it a lot. They get bubbly. They're sort of irrepressible in their excitement. Uh, so in this, uh, in this uh, uh, sense, fermentation is a primary engine for social change. Um, so I would just like to, uh, you know, sort of, you know, leave you with the, you know, suggestion that, uh, you know, incorporating these foods with live cultures can be very beneficial to our health. Uh, becoming directly involved with this process is a way of becoming more connected to uh, invisible biological forces that are around us and inside of us. Um, and also that we need to, um, you know, sort of take our excitement about, you know, reclaiming food and, uh, you know, creating greater uh, um, uh, sustainability in many other ways um, and, and become part of the social ferment and, uh, you know, and, and, and share all of, uh, you know, the exciting information that we get in a place like this and, and, and the stimulation of ideas. So, uh, so I thank you very much.